Good evening and welcome to the second in a series of webinars presented by the AFLEC Association of Barbados. I am Dr. Rudolph Aline, sports psychologist, sports science specialist and head of the Academy of Sport at the University of the West Indies Cape Hill Campus, Barbados. I'm your moderator for tonight's webinar. The topic for tonight is medical and psychological considerations for sports during COVID-19 with presentations from four of the leading experts in the field. After these presentations, we will take your questions for the panelists and you can say, send your questions via YouTube or you can join this live uh, and be very interactive with us and ask your questions. Our first panelist is Dr. Rene Bess, who is a specialist family and sports physician in private practice and also serves as the Barbados Defense Force Medical Officer, where he carries the rank of major. After completing his undergraduate medical training at the University of the West Indies, he received a master's in family medicine with distinction, followed by a doctor of medicine in family medicine. He also holds a master in sports medicine and a certificate in undersea and hyperbaric medicine. Dr. Bess is presently the chief medical officer for the CPL Cricket League, the chairman of the Barbados Football Association Medical Committee, and he sits on the medical advisory panel for Cricket West Indies. He also sits on the medical committee of the Athletic Association of Barbados and is a member of the National Anti-Doping Commission. He's also a member and former president of the Barbados Sports Medicine Association. Dr. Bess was the chief medical officer for the 2018 ICC T20 World Cup and has served as Barbados national team doctor for numerous tours, sports, uh, even in the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. Dr. Best will discuss the return to sport post-COVID infection. Dr. Best. And good evening to everyone. And thank you, Dr. Aline, for that warm welcome. And I want to really thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this webinar. I'm really excited to be here. Okay, so as Dr. Aline said, I'm going to be looking at that return to play of the athlete that had COVID-19, right? A very exciting topic and a very real topic in these days right now. So you just got to go as far as the social media or the news to see more and more athletes are becoming infected with COVID-19, the coronavirus. And as more and more persons become infected, more and more persons are recovering and we are seeing them return to their sports. But despite majority of persons getting better within a few weeks or so, we are seeing more and more persons that have lingering problems. And these fall into a category that we are now calling long haulers. What is a long hauler? That's a person that have had COVID-19 that continues to have symptoms for weeks and even months after it first started. This is becoming a real problem. You can see how this could, be, could impact a person's return to the sport and even their performance going forward as well. One British study actually states that about 10% of persons who get COVID-19 will become a long hauler. But depending on the study that you actually read, there are many saying higher figures, higher percentages as well, all right? But what we do know is that between 65 to 80% of individuals that get COVID-19, um, that percentage actually return to their pre-viral sort of state in two to three weeks. So we know that when we look among our sports persons, several persons will have possibly lingering issues, right? And what are some of these lingering issues that we could expect? Common ones would be the excessive fatigue, um, the excessive sort of shortness of breath, a persistent cough or so. But there are other problems. People are now talking a lot about brain fog. Um, they're having difficulty just thinking and concentrating. And just imagine being like that on the middle of a court trying to make some decisions, right? Then there are other individuals who are getting depression and anxiety that we have to deal with as well. And then there's some serious sort of persistent problems that are less common, but these will be effects on the heart, um, abnormal lung function with decreased lung capacity, and even um, kidney problems are now arising as well. So what this actually shows us is that this virus actually could attack nearly any organ, 
they could see organ damage right across the body, right? But there are two organs that I want to point out, and I want to sort of point out for the sports person, particularly the lungs, the respiratory system. We know that this virus it enters the body through either your nose, your mouth, or your eyes, and it actually has an affinity, it has a liking for the lungs, and there it can do some damage. Now, in doing that, it's decreasing your lung capacity, it's affecting, um, there's a, a lot more inflammation, etc., and there's less oxygen that you're taking up that will go to your brain and even your working muscles, the muscles that you want to be oxygenated. So we can see straight away how we can have impact on performance and the activity of the athlete. And now the one that really I'm concerned about is the heart, all right? Let me put it this way. The heart in the presence of COVID-19 is vulnerable to a condition called myocarditis. That's inflammation of the heart, all right? The problem with this, when you have inflammation of the heart, is that when you do strenuous physical activity, you are increased risk of sudden death. And that's my concern. So myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, is actually a recognized cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes under the age of 35. So this is why I want to put across to you that in our returning, we can't push the heart too fast, too, too hard, too fast, I would say. Right? We want to be a little more gradual with how we go about that. Okay, so before I start telling you some protocols for actually returning to sport, I want to be very clear that the athlete should have medical clearance. Right? You want to have that check over the doctor's assessment and you know if you need further investigations, if you, need, um, if you can even start trying to return to sport. But I want to put in a plug right now too that generally that we should all recognize that medical clearance is important for any athlete, not just with COVID, for when there's return from any illness, from any injuries, and even a long layaway from sports, right? So with that there, I want to start sorry, to introducing you to an actual protocol that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. It was published by Eli Elia et al. And let us walk through this here. I want to give you a practical way of looking at this. So this particular protocol is aimed actually more so for the mild cases, because as you can imagine, persons that have been hospitalized on ventilators or have more severe case um, effects of the virus will have their own personalized sort of specialized treatment plan going on. All right, and with this actual protocol, before we even start it, I want you to know that the person must be able to walk 500 meters on flat ground without excessive fatigue or breathlessness, must have at least had 10 days rest already, so, um, must be symptom free for the last seven days, and must be off all treatment. This includes paracetamol and panadols, okay, before we even start going forward in this here. And this is the layout of this protocol described by Elliot, which I've been using locally and regionally. It's a seven stage step to get you from getting that rest to right back to competition, all right? Now, stage one is a minimum of at least 10 days, but mainly the most of these stages, you must stay in them for at least two days, with the exception being 3A and 3B, which is each one day, right? The individual works their way up the stages gradually. But if you develop any symptoms at all at a particular stage, you must stop. At this stage, you stop and you wait until you've had 24 hours of no symptoms. And once you've had 24 hours of no symptoms, you go, you could restart at this preceding stage. So if you're at stage five when you got symptoms, and you stop, you rest, 24 hours of no symptoms, you start back at stage four, all right? What I will point out as well, that anyone having new symptoms, progressing symptoms, um, or even just persistent symptoms, should really stop and go back to the doctor, talk to them about that medical evaluation, see if we need to investigate further or anything like that, okay? So this gives you a, a good uh, sort of framework on how we return to, to play. But let me break it down practically for you. So minimum rest period, this is stage one. In this stage, you're allowed to do activities of daily living, all right? The aim here is to allow recovery. It is to give the, some protection for the heart and the lungs that I have this described to you. You must stay here at least 10 days. I must admit that I modify that. I, I personally, because several other guidelines as well say 14 days, I use 14 days at this stage. Uh, I find that we have to also give persons 
a little extra time sometimes possess the psychological readjustment. So I just want to put in the plug there that we must take care of them physically and psychologically. Bear in mind that when you're looking at guidelines as well, think about what your sporting federation may have as a guideline, as well as what is your national guidelines. I could say for starters too, in Barbados, we have persons that go into isolation. They're in isolation for at least 10 days if they had no symptoms and at least 14 days if they had symptoms as well. So sometimes you can think about what else is going on or wrong and don't just blindly follow some guidelines, okay? But if you successfully um, pass stage one, you're gonna go to the light activity stage two. This is where you could do some walking, light jogging, use a stationary bike. There's no resistance training here. You're gonna spend at least two days in stage two. Right. The aim here is to increase your heart rate. And if you're one that monitor your heart rate, you're going to be keeping that under 70% of your maximum heart rate. All right. And the duration at this stage, you're going to be only exercising for 15 minutes or less. And if successful there, we're moving on to stage 3A, where we're looking at an increase in the frequency of training. All right. Here now we're adding some simple movements, activities. The aim here is to increase the load gradually. You want to sort of manage that sort of fatigue that comes after having a viral illness, right? Some of these uh, simple movements might be even just running drills, okay? You're gonna be, your duration of act, um, activity here is gonna be for 30 minutes or less. And here again, you're now gonna watch your heart rate and you're gonna be keeping that under 80% of your maximum heart rate. If you succeed there, you're going on to 3B. 3B, we're now going to be incorporating, getting you to exercise, incorporating coordination and some of the skills and tactics of your sport as well. So you can see this is going to be adding a little more complex activities that your coach might come up with, you know, some hurdle hops or so. But you're still keeping your heart rate on the what? Yes, I hear you shouting, less than 80%, all right? But your duration of exercise now could be up to 45 minutes, right? 45 minutes or less. And then that means that you graduate to stage four, which is normal training activities, right? You're going to be trying to restore that confidence in this, that you do for your sports. You're going to be assessing that functional skills or so. So you're keeping your heart rate still under 80% of the maximum heart rate, but now you could go up to an hour in your training. So this is giving you a practical way of how a coach or your trainer could actually take you forward. And if you're having no symptoms still, no symptoms at this point, guess where you go? Five comes after four, right, people? So stage five is where you can resume normal training progression as your coach want you. You can rejoin the team, et cetera, with what they're doing, um, trying to just progress normally. And if successful here, note, there's no limitation here on the time or the maximum heart rate. You, you'll go as you would normally be training, all right? And if successful, you're gonna be like this guy just jumping over the fence because you are now qualifying for stage six, return to competition, right? So this gives you a very practical sort of approach. Um, and that's really a little summary there as I start to really take note of the time and hand you back over to Dr. Aline. I mean, and I might carry home points or yes, we're gonna be trying to prevent persons from catching COVID-19, but if you do have COVID-19, we're gonna try to decrease the harm that it could do with a gradual return to play. And Dr. Aline, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Bess. Um, of course, I have a few questions for you, uh, so don't, don't run away. Uh, the first one, is there any specialized testing necessary in the medical clearance for athletes who may have had COVID-19? Yes, sir. So this is a, actually a very good question, because I say if you had asked me that four months ago, the debate was going one direction. I'm thinking if you ask me that four months from now, it will be a different answer to what I'm about to give you, right? The guidelines have been changing a bit. But definitely we are preaching that everyone get that medical clearance, everyone have that physical examination or so, and you could have some individualized plans as needed based on symptoms or any, anything that they're presenting with. But the general consensus as we look across all the various guidelines is that for mild cases, no. There's, yeah, there won't be any sort of specialized testing once you have done that examination or so, all right? But I say that point to note that when people are in the severe cases, definitely they will have certain tests that will be done. And stressing that a person with new progressing or persistent symptoms will need further investigations. These investigations could range from your 
blood tests looking at damage to heart, et cetera, to ECG, a heart test, the echo, the, um, the ultrasound of the heart, um, exercise stress test where you're making a person run and see what's happening with the heart, up to even a lot of persons are talking about cardiac MRI, right? And you ask this question at a very interesting time because two days ago, an uh, article was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine where a group of European experts were putting, putting forward the argument that everyone, as much as I say what the consensus is now, I was telling you how it might change, they're saying that everyone, even if you had no symptoms at all, should have at least an ECG. And they're pushing if you're lucky to even do a, a echo a cardiogram. But that opens a whole discussion. Um, uh, that's a necessary discussion because in a small country like ours, my question is really, is it absolutely necessary one? And once you pass that there, do we have the resources to just do it on everyone? That's money, personnel. Your personnel have to be able to read the ECG and see that it's not just a cardiac, uh, an athlete's heart and not mix it up with something wrong as such. Um, so very interesting discussion, but at this point in time, my answer is a simple, no, we don't have to, but I've given you that explanation. Okay, great, great. Now suppose an athlete, um, you know, we're hearing a lot of people are asymptomatic. Suppose an athlete is infected, but somehow they don't know. Uh, does he or she run the risk of you know, having any serious medical repercussions um, from being infected? Yeah. So. This is the reality right now, you know, with community spread, et cetera, there's a reality that this is possible. Um, some of the studies actually have shown that there's no major risk if there have been no symptoms, um, if we accidentally are competing like that, right? I say that to say, my take is if there's no symptoms or no high index of suspicion, the person can proceed, right? Obviously coming out of lockdowns, et cetera, I think we should be graduating or training load anyhow, all right? Um, but however, athletes are very good at knowing their body. And there's a point I'll put across. And this is where I say, with high index of suspicion and athletes just reporting back that they know the body, we could take that into account and see how to proceed. So if you are custom running a split in two minutes and you're now doing three minutes, hey, re report that, let's, let's look at it further. If you are going to basketball training and running suicides, um, and you're normally leading the pack, and now Dr. Best could beat you while doing a single leg hop, we got to check that out. And I say, report that to your medical doctor so that we could probably analyze, is it that you have a, the infection is acute and active, or is it that you have had it in the past and you're having lingering sort of uh, symptoms of it when you do that? So I'm saying with that, we could actually take all of that into account and act accordingly, do further testing as needed or so. But generally speaking, you're good to go if there's no sort of hint towards it. Okay, great. Uh, and I'll give you one more question before mm -hmm. we move on. And, and for those who are joining us, um, you can keep your questions until the end and you can pose them to uh, Dr. Bess. Um, you, you spoke about issues with lung capacity and issues with the heart. I know it's very early days, um, but do you suspect that these uh, issues with the heart and the lungs um, there's some way of bringing the heart and the lungs back to full capacity, or will these issues last the duration of the life of the athlete? Yeah, you know, it's a hard question. I'm going to be honest, because we're learning so much as we go along. Um, there are persons that, yes, are getting scarring of these muscles, uh, lung tissue, as well as the heart or so. So there is the possibility of lasting effects. But what I also tell the athlete coming off with um, the lung issues is that there's some of them that do get some lung recovery, but you have to be patient because the lung recovery could take anywhere from three months to 12 months. So, and I will also point out, you should really follow your doctor's advice. I mean, I think early treatment, et cetera, is very crucial. And as well, your therapist, your, your doctor may include a pulmonary specialist. Your therapist may include a respiratory therapist where you could do some certain breathing exercises and stuff like that. Um, and really, it almost feels like it's a wait and see, see, because I can't predict who will go which route, you know? Um, you can minimize some of this heart issues as well with this sort of gradual return where you have not push things beyond where you're now developing arrhythmias because of damage to the heart. You know, arrhythmias is the irregular heartbeats and stuff like that. Um, so a lot to still learn about it, but the things that we have control over is where we could do our rehabilitative stuff, be it 
rest or rehab. We could be patient because people, some people will recover, yes, um, but it will take some time. And really, if you have edit, other medical conditions, I say, get control of them. If you have diabetes, keep it under control. And nothing beats some good nutrition and being well hydrated. You want to keep those mucous membranes in the lungs pretty good um, and healthy as well. And those are the little things you could do, but a lot is still being learned about the damage that could be done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bess. And it seems as though you're saying to us, you know, there's no fast, quick way of recovering from COVID. You know, we just have to take time to work the body back to the normal place it was before. Uh, and we have to be patient. All right. So thank Definitely. you very much, Dr. Bess. Thank you. No for problem. Very thank enlightening you. Uh, presentation. Yeah. Up next, our, our second presenter for the night. Uh, it's Dr. Ariane Harvey, a specialist in internal medicine who has been practicing in Barbados for the last seven years. Dr. Harvey studied medicine at the University of the West Indies, and, uh, West Indies sorry, and completed her postgraduate training at Yale University. Currently, she's a consultant in internal medicine at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and a lecturer in the Faculty of Medical Science at the University of the West Indies. She also runs her own private office and hospital practice. More recently, Dr. Harvey has been supporting the COVID-19 response by sitting on several advisory groups, including BAP COVID Task Force. Dr. Harvey will present on COVID-19 vaccination and the sports person. Welcome, Dr. Harvey. Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you for the invitation to, the, to speak at this webinar. Good night, everybody. Um, We've heard about the range of physical effects that you can get from COVID infection in anybody and particularly in the athletes and how that impacts performance. And soon we'll hear about the psychological impacts as well with our later speakers. So with all the things that Dr. Best has alluded to with respect to possibly being, even if you're asymptomatic, going all the way to the other end, other end where you may be a patient who has long COVID and has long-term impact on your performance. Prevention is better than cure. So let's talk a bit about vaccination and the sports person. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen if I can figure out how to do that. One second. So we've had a really rough year <laughs> with respect to COVID. And I say we as in Barbados, healthcare providers, the average layperson, person, athletes included. It's been tough. We started off with Barbados' first two cases of coronavirus in March. Um, we did the right thing by locking down to try and decrease case numbers and prevent community spread. And we did quite well with that. Um, the rest of the world didn't do so well, and that actually led to one of the bigger impacts of sports kind of internationally recognized with the postponement of the 2020 Olympics, um, which I had planned to go to, so I'm, I'm quite sad about that. Um, and, you know, Barbados continued along nicely, so much so that we opened up our economy fully to facilitate holidays for the winter season. We wanted Barbados to be able to come home to their loved ones who were abroad and we wanted to make sure and try and preserve our economy. The people who came to our country, our, our own and visitors came with love in their hearts, but also some of them brought the, vaccine, the um, virus. And by the beginning of the new year, unfortunately, we had the beginnings of an outbreak that we know now today um, was quite substantial. In between this, um, I'm a former swimmer, not particularly the fast one, but <laughs> COVID, you know, our lockdown here um, that we went into for the second time did also force po postponement of local sporting activities, swimming one of them. And we ended up having, you know, a full on pause um, in February to try and, and said, keep cases or get control of our cases while trying to maintain the rest of the country. A bit of a silver lining, which is what I'm going to focus on, is that we received as a very gracious gift from India, 100,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And so that's what I'll talk about. Um, in preparation also, and in context, we opened up the country a bit in phased staging from March 1st, 
So it means that we are out, back outside, albeit carefully. Cases are still around, but we now have some form of protection. So the vaccine that we have available to us is the Oxford AstraZeneca. It's a two-dose vaccine and it's given 12 weeks apart. It provides over 60% protection from becoming infected by COVID-19. It's recommended to anyone over the age of 18, but especially individuals who have risk factors that would predispose them to developing severe COVID if they got infected. And you've heard this in, in the media and public education programs. So these are individuals who have comorbidities or um, conditions like diabetes, obesity, older, more frail individuals, hypertension, et cetera, lung disorders, et cetera. Um, there are actually very few medical conditions that are addressed on an individual basis where a patient would be recommended not to get the vaccine. So generally it's for everyone, athletes and sports persons included. Um, the, the Oxford AstraZeneca works using viral vector technology. And that sounds very fancy. And a lot of people have read about it and, and, it's, and it's been a bit of a whirlwind in terms of the, the technology that's been used. But it's basically a harmless virus that can get into our cells, where, but it can't multiply and it can't cause infection. So we've used that virus to carry a piece of the COVID-19 into our own cells and teach our cells to make COVID-19 proteins that we then show to our immune systems. Our immune system then uses the presence of these proteins as a warm-up practice for COVID. So that if you are exposed to COVID, you've already warmed up and you will be protected from getting it or from becoming seriously ill. So essentially COVID vaccination is warm up against the true infection so that when you get in the game, you're prepared and you will do well, you'll win. So all athletes and sports persons should get vaccinated. The question I'm sure many of you have is, if I do get vaccinated, how is that going to affect my performance and possibly my ability to compete? And there are a few reasons as to why the COVID, the, the athlete or sports person should really be vaccinated, even though generally we're very healthy, we all a very healthy population. Sports increase risk for getting COVID-19. They're generally or can be aerosolizing events. You are running around, you're heavy breathing, you may be shouting to your teammate on a field or on a court. Some sports limit your ability to don PPE for long periods of time, mask wearing while running and social distancing in, in group and team sports. And competition itself, unfortunately, is the perfect setup for spread in many cases. You're bringing in two groups of people, two bubbles, one of which may have a COVID exposure. It may be from different parts of the same place, like parishes on an island, or it may be from different countries or different continents. And as Dr. Bess alluded to earlier, isolation, if you do get infected, isolation or exposed rather, isolation disrupts your training. And any symptom can affect your performance. So sports does increase your risk of getting COVID-19 and does impact or can impact your performance. And vaccination lowers that risk. So as I said, all athletes should aim to be vaccinated. Now, there are some side effects that everybody worries about and there's some issues that we think about. And when we're addressing those issues, we can, the Lancet actually published an article recently about how to go about mediating or mitigating the effects of the vaccination process. So the first stage is actual the vaccination. It's an intramuscular vaccine, which means the needle goes into your muscle by virtue of being a sports person, you're using muscles for the most part. And so you may have some immediate or just after local injection site. Obviously, if you're someone who plays with your upper limbs, that swelling or pain to the site can interfere with your performance. And you can get around that by one, adequate administration. And we know from our public health nurses across the board that administration has been going flawlessly. You don't feel the state. The swelling afterwards, you feel a bit but you can get around that or diminish that by applying ice or using non-opiate um, pain medications. And that goes away after a couple of days if you have it. The next stage in terms of things that can impact you as an athlete after being vaccinated include the side effects that you hear from the vaccine. And the side effects have scared a lot of people and may well be scaring you too. Side effects can be very mild or absent even, or they can be quite unpleasant. 
And worst case scenario, you can have a side effect or really a, tr an, a reaction, which can be a severe allergic reaction. For this particular vaccine that we've had on island and for our vaccination process that's been occurring over the last few weeks, we actually have had no recorded cases of severe allergic reaction requiring hospitalization. So this vaccine is pretty safe. We do expect that you may experience some side effects, which may be flu-like, feeling achy, feeling tired. Um, you may feel a little bit dizzy or not yourself and some gastroenteritis type um, reactions as well. Fever, you may feel nauseous. You may vomit once or feel like you need to vomit. Some people may have a couple episodes of some loose stools. And that tends to go away after about three days. Worst case scenario, five, but it gets progressively better as we get closer to that end of the four or five days. Those side effects, one, you can prepare yourself to know that this is what's going to happen so that you know, you're not blindsided by the fact that you thought this may be a symptomless um, process. But also, if you speak to your coach and your trainers and you, you know, you're looking at your timing in terms of getting the vaccine, that's around the time where you can scale back a little bit on training for the next two, three days to accommodate for these side effects and make sure to hydrate and have your paracetamol ready. The third more longer term issue with respect to getting your vaccination is the fact that the one we have now is a two dose vaccine. So that means that the symptoms of and side effects that you had at the first dose, you're very likely to experience similar side effects 12 weeks later or three months later. And often in preparing for training and competition, scheduling is really important. So taking that into account when you are going into getting vaccinated, both dates and timing for those, uh, if you can, around your training can help decrease the impact of side effects on your training and your, and your competition. If you don't get your second dose, you don't get as great immunity. And then you put yourself at a little bit less protection from all the things with respect to COVID infection that Dr. Best mentioned earlier. The last thing I just wanted to touch on, because it is controversial and it, I've been asked about it generally for travel, but obviously it will impact the athletes as well. Immunity or vaccine and travel passports. Many of us um, have, you know, been wondering how we're going to go on that first trip after, you know, when COVID ends. And now that vaccination proves a possibility for COVID ending or at least a return to some normalcy, athletes may now also have to consider if vaccination is something that may be required certainly for travel and entry into countries because the, the um, prerequisite has been set already. Um, with respect to like yellow fever to get into Jamaica. And also with actually being eligible to compete. I don't think we're there yet. And I think that's quite controversial, but it's definitely something you want to think about when you're making your decision or whether or not to get vaccinated. So my take home points are the risk of COVID-19 getting it remains quite high. Yes, we are starting to go back outside, but COVID is still outside. Every manifestation of COVID-19 infection from asymptomatic to severe infection impacts your physical and psychological performance in some way. So vaccines against COVID provide protection and you can feel confident that they're safe and effective. The side effects are tolerable, they may be unpleasant, but they are self-limited. And their impact on your performance can be minimized so that you don't lose, so that you lose as little time and as little performance in training and competition. And I'm gonna hand back over to Dr. Alling. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. I have a few questions coming in for you. A uh, question from a YouTube viewer. Um, one top sports agency is saying that athletes likely to, uh, to have some kind of different immune response to the vaccine um, than to the general population. Is that true? Um, I would not necessarily say in terms of different immune response. Generally, athletes are fitter and younger. Um, on one hand, younger people, they have a more robust immune system generally, so they may have more side effects just because their immune system is ready to go. Um, but you can still have athletes who have no symptoms when they get their, their vaccine. And then in terms of the actual immune response, not in any way that would impact the protection that the vaccine provides you. So certainly go ahead. You may have, you know, to take that paracetamol for an extra day if your immune system is ready, but absolutely, no, you can, as in terms of no major different impact, and certainly you should get the vaccine if it's available. 
him. Okay. Uh, there's thought that the vaccination does not prevent you from uh, getting uh, the virus or spreading it. So why some athletes may ask, why then should I take the vaccine? That's a great question. Um, because when you're making a decision to have anything done medically, <laughs> you kind of want to, you know, make your decision sensibly. So the vaccine protects you from getting infected in, let's say, 70% of persons who receive it. 70 is certainly better than zero. And our standard kind of um, standardization point for a vaccine being effective, and this is for all the vaccines that come out, even from when we were kids in those vaccinations, is over 50% um, in terms of the usefulness and efficacy or, or how much a vaccine protects you. I think also it's important to recognize that even if you are protected 70% and your teammate is protected 70%, even if you are both exposed, the chances that 30, 30% chance is still much less and also transmission is much less. So even if you do get infected, your transmission rates may well be lower. And so overall, you almost get a herd community with herd immunity within your sports bubble. So it's still very important to take what protection you can get, because as I said, you don't want to risk your obviously individual health, but also the health of your ability to perform as an athlete, um, just because you don't have 100% vaccination from this vaccine. 100% protection. Great. Uh, is there any evidence of any uh, negative effects of vaccinations on the competitive population versus the average population? So not that we have seen thus far in the studies in terms of um, long-term effects in negatively. No, there's short-term stuff, which I went through earlier, short-term issues, but long-term no, um, unless you have a complication or severe event from your vaccination, which are, as I said, quite rare. For example, if you had anaphylaxis, went into shock and then ended up in the ICU, extremely rare and unlikely. But obviously then your, the impact on your performance would be because you became um, ill from that allergic reaction. From vaccines themselves, generally no. And actually there's been a, a, a lot of studies on vaccinating elite athletes to see how, how they perform and how it affects performance. And they haven't found anything that definitively says that there's any long-term impact on performance negatively. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harvey. Um, stay on the line, because I know at the end, we'll probably have some more questions for you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Our third presenter for the night is Dr. June Cattle, who is a senior tutor of the Division of General and Continuing Education and Head of the Physical Education Department at the Barbados Community College. Dr. Cattle earned a Doctor of Philosophy in Educational Psychology with an emphasis in sports psychology from the University of the West Indies Cafil campus, where she lectured and coordinated some of the sports psychology courses there. She has served as president of the Barbados Society of Psychology, the vice president of the Central American and Caribbean University Sports Organizations, a board member of the Pan American University Sports Federation. And she also served on the World Anti-Doping Agency Education Board. She has also been the coach and manager of numerous junior and senior athletic teams for Barbados. Dr. Carroll is the second vice president of the Athletic Association of Barbados, a member of the American Psychological Association Division 47 and the American Board of Sports Psychology. She is also a board member of the National Anti-Doping Commission and has presented on sports psychology to national and regional athletes and teams. Dr. Cattle has a research interest in peak performance in sport and personality cor correlation to optimal sports performance. Tonight, Dr. Cattle will speak on the psychological support for athletes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Cattle. Thank you very much, Dr. Aileen, for your presentation. I will, I'm very pleased to be able to present today on the topic of psychological support in the time of COVID. I have no conflicts to disclose, so we can carry on. We'll talk a little bit about the phases of the emotional challenges brought by the overarching COVID-19 pandemic. We'll mention the stressors, the protective and pr promotive factors, and some tips to take us into the management and recovery from COVID-19, all in an attempt to answer and resolve respond to the question of how to provide psychological support in the time of COVID. 
The old sport world was so different to COVID world. But as sports people do, we plan for the beat down and the recovery to the new dynamic because it would not be the same. That must evolve as a result of our life experience over the past year. You must therefore examine the stressors and the protective factors. As athletes build their confidence, they're required to manage three categories of stressors according to Sarkar and Fletcher, the competitive, the organizational, and the personal. So when we look at those stressors or we look at um, COVID-19, we will find that COVID-19 has challenged all them in all those areas, in the personal as well. In terms of protective and promotive factors, we can identify five particular areas, positive personality, motivation, confidence, focus, perceived social support. And this is where we can make input where input is needed. In terms of personality, well, there's no such thing as an athlete personality. Athletes are individuals and they share the same commonalities as some in some areas, but we are faced with these unique beings for whom there's no one universal vaccine that will solve um, performance issues with or without COVID. So we must support these individuals at this time as at any other time. We must help them to be solutions-based, have a positive approach to surviving and actually trying to thrive at this particular time. Some research in the previous years has shown a sample of local athletes to be low in autonomy. So autonomy supported by environment should be useful for them. The workouts for which they are now personally responsible and individually responsible might actually create for them a stimulus towards more autonomous functioning and thus more chances of high performance. So there can be some positives. Athletes compete, that's what they do. Um, they, all feel, they always feel that they can work through or power through anything, but this they cannot fix with an extra set or an extra web. We cannot physically power through this. So we have to be strategic in our approach to motiva motivational athletes when they are finding intrinsic motivation is a difficult thing for them. There are considerations for health safety, financial safety, and general feelings of anxiety. So the mental health of athletes during COVID cannot be automatically determined. Right, we have risk takers. You know, the ones who throw themselves backward over a bar, which is 2.20 meters or more high. Those who go full speed at barriers up to waist and chest height. And those who face balls coming at them 100 miles per hour. Those. So those are risk takers. They will not be afraid of the little thing with some little spikes, would they be? They might be raring to go and willing to compete and, and being able to optimally perform optimally after they get, they get out of confinement. They might just be ready to show the world that they're in pursuit of vertical when they can control this thing. They might be the ones who thrive under this threat. What they crave is control, like the race car drivers. They control where others dare not even threat. But the quality is this is we cannot control this virus. So we might have to manage their cases, particularly in terms of removing them from the additional, the additional risk that they may take in pursuit of excellence. The risk averse athlete, on the other hand, might be assured that things are safe outside his cocoon before he or she would venture out and try to compete and give his or her all. So we must then be aware of the nuances from one person to another that would indicate what psychological assistance the athletes would need. Athletes and stakeholders make much reference to mental strength. Athletes are accustomed to discomfort, discomfort in training and traveling, adjusting their diet and feeling physical pain and total exhaustion. Their perspective, however, might very well be influenced by mood. And a lot of them are very sensitive to the moods of those people around them. So you, as a support staff and support personnel, need then to be able to maintain a positive mood around athletes. And that will definitely help them. One way we can help them is just that to do that, to remain calm and be rational in the face of this difficulty. We must be aware that global self-esteem is tied to their domain-specific physical and sports-specific self-esteem. So if they cannot perform physically, if they cannot participate in sport, it might be a little blow to their self-esteem. So this opportunity now is there for them to improve the little things about their sport performance. They need to be able then to 
feed into their satisfaction, their self-esteem by giving them little tasks, minor tasks to do that would assist them in being able to perform better much later. So we need to feed their global self-concept of Conta Harter 2012. So um, the challenge though occurs right when the academic challenge is also great. So their academic self-esteem might suffer some, somewhat of a challenge at, at this time. So we have the physical and sports specific self-esteem being challenged as well as the academic self-esteem. So we need then to focus on the effective aspect, the feel good aspect of athletes and their participation in sports, how good their bodies feel when they push themselves to the limit, when they train. And when they train alone, you can heighten that and be more aware of their feelings. So mindfulness is one approach that can be used. Um, Mindfulness-based interventions might boost self-regulation. So we can use this with regulating their autonomic function. What do we mean by this? We mean that we can test athletes, um, their heart rate variability to check to see who is more likely to to panic, who is more likely to experience high level of anxiety, and then um, suggest for them some modalities, some intervention, and then suggest other modalities for the for the people who would have been um, who, who who would have lost mobility, uh, who who would have been demobilized, and as a result of COVID nineteen and, and our and our situation. Mm -hmm. One thing that we cannot overlook is the power of full engagement. Jim Laura and Tony Schwartz suggested that you can find the energy profile of an athlete. So then we can look at the spiritual, the mental, the emotional and the physical engagement, check to see at which engagement level athletes are deficient. And we can measure those levels of engagement and then suggest strategies, suggest interventions that would improve their full engagement towards peak performance. Some action points, so um, offer validation to the athlete's sense of loss. They've lost loved ones. They've lost opportunities they've, for milestone events, Olympics, their first grifter, their last World, World, World University Games, their last Olympics, they might've lost those opportunities. So you need to validate, validate those feelings, that sense of loss. Attribution retraining, you need to teach them how to take a different perspective um, in more or less blame setting for, for the events that would have happened. Emphasize controllability. There are things that were within your sphere of con concern, but things for which you're directly responsible, work on the things you can control. Give the athletes permission to be with their family, to work more on injury, to work more on their relationships and their other skills. Relieve them of the shame and guilt of not being able to perform as athletes when they know they ought to be they're performing. So, you know, the, the coaches and especially need to give them a little time, not pile it on. Relieve them of that sense. Be available virtually. Assist with the goal setting and mental and, and cognitive flexibility. What do you mean by the mental and cognitive flexibility? Their ability to see different sides of things. So they might not be Olympics 2021. There was not Olympics 2020. You change. You prepare for 2021. But you also maintain the possibility that you may have to um, look to 2022. So be able to change your focus, change your mind, change your thinking, and then work towards a fantastic next opportunity whenever that comes. So avoid catastrophizing. One, op one missed opportunity is not the end of the world. You can make the analogy between being boxed in in terms of um, in terms of lockdown and quarantine and stuff, we can make the analogy between that and being boxed in in sports scenarios like cycling and boxing and distance racing. You know, we, you boxed in, that's not the end of the world. In basketball, you think of a way to get out, you call for help, you call for a teammate, you call a parent, you call the coach, you call for a mental performance coach, you call for the psychologist. So that is that's a really wonderful way to look at it. Maintain and reinforce team rituals. So even though like if you're in track and fitness in individual sport, there are some team rituals, team greetings, team chants, and those can be done virtually so that you get that feeling of the team, reinforce the team colors and all, and all the team values that um, you would have emph emphasized before so that they still feel a part of that entity because connection is what they craved. We had promised that after 2020, things would have improved. We said in 2021, it'll be great, everything will be fine. We broke that contract. 
No, we have to fix the damage. We have to be the support team to pull the athletes out from that. So what do we do? Adaptation, stabilization, and balance. Learn to accept the new limitation. Stabilize your thought processes. Come to a point where you can you understand you've figured out, the athletes have figured out what to do, how to travel to and from training and competition safely. Um, skills production, have no work on that, and the whole question of balance and stress management. Right, so basically we can start to wrap up in terms of the final things we can do. Right, Mr. Alling, Dr. Alling? Yes, so as members <laughs> of the support team, we are required to do the following. <laughs> Build trust, respect athletes and their decision-making and be the ever-guiding force supporting, coaching, teaching skills. And I can't overemphasize the whole concept of focusing on skills as opposed to competition in this time as we learn how to deal with the, with the, uh, uh, with the pandemic. So as we wrap up, a word to athletes, you have the power to negotiate this. A word to parents, be the supportive force that you know you're meant to be. Financially, things might be a little different. You might have to balance survival with support for your child's um, training and, and coaching or whatever. Um, see sport as a way through this uh, for survival for the child. A word to sport administrators, maintain communication, be creative with your online connections like, like we're doing. A word to coaches, reinforce skills, reinforce physical and mental skills and be aware of the high emotions that might result. So the last words, I take my last words from the recommendations of McIntyre and Alan. I said last words before, right? Good. Connect outdoors, visualize. Let's look at three of those quickly. Connect. Sport occurs in a social context. So keep that social contract, maintain the connection. Outdoors, use the green spaces, the fields, um, teach athletes to appreciate their surroundings. The blue spaces, yes, the beach, we have that. Visualize, um, promote mental pictures of effort and the connection of, between effort and success. Um, have the athletes figure out what the better athlete would look like if they would have worked on, on their deficiencies. Identify, identify feelings, pleasant ones, the unpleasant ones, and find the root cause of those. Discover the key psychological strengths and, and work on the strengths, and then recover, rest manage your emotions, manage screen time, manage social media time, block out time wasters, work on your immune system. And as our other speakers said, take care of great nutrition, good nutrition, good hygiene, take time for self-care, right? So um, I think we'll wrap up there and I think I'm out of time. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Allen. Thank you, Dr. Kat, thank you very much. We have a few questions for you, of course. Uh, yes, of course. And you, you touched a little bit, you said a little bit about self-esteem. Uh, and one of the questions is, how, how do you see COVID-19 and the whole impact of COVID-19 maybe affecting the self-esteem of some of our athletes here in Barbados? You see, there, there's, some, there's some people whose self-esteem is directly and, and very fully tied to, to the social acceptance they get when they're out there performing, competing, winning. So their self, their self esteem is very well connected to that personality. So we need them to look at that aspect of their personality and give them support, give them other things to focus on so that they will feel good about themselves. Small individual tasks that they can work on on their own, succeed in their tasks, and then build the self-efficacy, the self-esteem, the self-concept, the, the way they think about themselves and the way they, they value themselves. Okay, great, great. Are, are there any major uh, psychological challenges which you see uh, or local athletes especially having as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic? And how can we deal with some of those? There's a concept of hope and um, versus despair. And you hear from a lot of the comments from the athletes, despair coming through. Because like I said, we broke the contract. We, we, we didn't produce the things that we, we said we would. Not to any fault of ours, but they're saying, but you know, we were supposed to have crypto. We were supposed to be able to go to the Olympics and none of that happens. So why should we train? So there's a sense of hopelessness coming through. So I think that's a major thing to work on in building the whole concept of hope, the whole concept of positive thinking, the whole concept of um, building self-efficacy through action, through so, so specific actions that will help build that, that hope and that self-belief back. 
Great, great, great. And our last question for this uh, section. How then do you see us motivating those athletes back to the place where they were pre-COVID-19? What are some of the key things that we can do to help motivate them? You know, luckily, a lot of them are just rearing to get back out there. So we're, we're, more, we're more or less holding them back from being out there um, in, in a lot of instances. But in some other instances, we need them to help them with the goal setting aspect of it and with the focusing aspect of it so that we can re-motivate them to get back out there, to put their lives on the line, to take the chances that we need to do health-wise, financial-wise, um, and so on, so that they can get these benefits. And we would have built those benefits in through our goal setting, short, medium, and long-range goal setting, and um, shared goal setting so that we can tap into things that they actually wish to achieve and that are meaningful to them. So it's very much an individual thing and there's no general um, motivational strategy that we can use for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat for you. Let me see if I can pull it that, pull it up, sorry. Uh, how would you explain in relation to persons that are physically challenged? So how would you explain uh, those psychological challenges and dealing with them? or someone, an athlete who may be physically challenged? Physically challenged? Well, uh, so physical challenge too is, is, is very much individual. So what you do with the people with physical challenged people or people with physical challenge is that, is that you focus on what they can do. So you don't focus on their disabilities, you focus on their abilities. You try to find ways for them to work on upper, upper body strength at home, in their backyard, if, um, if they're Lower, lower limb mobility is the issue. So you find things that are positive for them and uh, I'll, I'll work with those. And in every case, you need to, to focus on what you can control and what you can do. And YouTube is a good place to find different activities uh, to expand your knowledge as the person doing the guiding or doing the coaching and providing the opportunities and, and the knowledge and, and the tasks perform for, for these people um, the physical challenges. Um, the, whole, the same promises hold um, and the same trust towards regaining hope in what could be a positive future and what will indeed be a, is a positive future. The cognitive flexibility, uh, man managing emotions, managing rejection, man managing negativity, managing fear. So we, we need to manage those kind of things and, and, and show them safe ways of doing things, things uh, ways of planning for the future, things that can actually happen, things that are already approachable, uh, and keep focusing on, on that. It's uncertain for us. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're um, welcome. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Before we move on to our final uh, presenter for the night, um, we are happy that you have joined us uh, for this very important webinar, but we are asking that you do not record or restream this webinar. You can join us on YouTube. If you want to view it again, you can join us on YouTube to do that. And it seems as though someone is restreaming or recording and we would like you not to. Thank you very much. Our fourth and final presenter for the night is Dr. Adrian Law. President of the serve as the team physician for many of Barbados' teams at major games and Olympics, and was the chair of the commission of NACA and the National Anti-Doping Commission. He is currently the vice chairman of the Caribbean Regional Anti-Doping Organization, and has been a member of the Medical Commission of Casco and Pan Am Sports since 1993. Additionally, he has served with the World Anti-Doping Agency WADA in many capacities since the year 2000, and is a life member of the Athletic Association of Barbados. In 2014, Dr. Lord was awarded the Order of the British Empire, or OBE, for his contribution to sports medicine. He was also honored with awards by the IOC in 1998 for sports ethics, and in 2009 for sports and the fight against doping. 
In 2019, he was presented with a plaque of merit at the World Championship Gala in Doha by the IAAF, now World Athletics. Dr. Lord will address the anti-doping protocols during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Lord. Thank you very much, Dr. Aline. Um, and thanks for that kind introduction. And I also would like to express gratitude to the AAB for inviting me to sit among this, amongst this prestigious uh, panel. My topic will be protocols, changing the protocols to, in anti-doping. It's interesting that this year we have the new world anti-doping code and I actually got my copy only, original copy, copy only this week. But the World Anti-Doping Code is the Bible of anti-doping, so to speak. And I'm going to shift by speaking a bit about the code, what is new in the code, which is anti-doping, and then head into something, a few things about doping controls over around um, COVID-19. I'm going to share my screen. So there are some changes to anti-doping protocols, not only because of COVID-19, but because of the World Anti-Doping Code, which came into effect in January. We're going to talk about some new sanctions, about doping controls during the pandemic. Look at the, well, I'm not going to talk too much about the list, but you know there's a new list every year. We're about Athlete Central, what is that? And what, who or what is Adams? So the, World Anti-Doping Code came into effect on January 1st this year. I'm going to use this opportunity to say a little bit about it. It also comes with eight international standards for testing, results management for labs, um, therapeutic use exemptions. And in this code, health is the top rationale. It also is athlete friendly and it's all about protecting athletes' rights. And there's the Athlete Anti-Doping Rights Act. And this code ensures consistency in anti-doping programs globally. In the code, there is there are some new anti-doping rule violations that we added. And <clears throat> one is to protect whistleblowers, people who give information to anti-doping organizations. Uh, engaging in fraudulent conduct is now considered a separate offense. There's also definitions of what a protected person, that is a minor or athlete lacking legal capacity or one with intellectual impairment, especially young athletes. We talk about recreational athletes because there's a new category of athletes that was not before mentioned in the code. The code is almost a living document. This one, last one was in 19, 2015 and, and things changed. And also we had to make a definition of what a retired athlete is. So there are also new sanctions in the World Anti-Doping Code. Bans can be increased by an additional two years if there's aggravating circumstances um, where the person obviously purposely did it, uh, used various drugs, imported the drugs, other things have been added to that. There are also shorter bans that can be given for substances of abuse. I notice that substances of abuse have been incorporated now in the code, but if you use substances of abuse in competition. And it was determined that you actually use them out of competition and all related to sports performance. Now you can, a shorter ban. And we know only yesterday in the House Assembly that we got a little lenient on, on use of marijuana in Barbados. And the code is also a little lenient on use of substances abuse, of abuse. Also a ban of four or more years can be reduced to one year if that, by one year, sorry, if that person actually ad admits the anti-doping rule violation and accepts the sanction within 20 days. So if you don't make the people waste time, you might get a year off. Admit and let's move on. No, this is COVID-19 pandemic time. <clears throat> uh, a few changes to the protocols that have been in place by the World Anti-Doping Agency. As you know, the NADO, the National Anti-Doping Commission, the RADO, the Regional Anti-Doping Organization, and all international federations, all countries, all sports, sporting bodies, Olympic bodies, and so on, international federations, all use the same rules and regulations. 
as per in the code, as per in the, in the in international standards. So there's now a pre-notification questionnaire. So before testing an athlete, there are some questions that the sample collection person will ask to find out if the person is COVID-19 positive or being around somebody who's been COVID-19 positive or awaiting the result for a, a PCR test or a rapid test or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> we also now restrict persons who are vulnerable from being sample collection officers. And you've heard um, Dr. Harvey speak about the vulnerable persons, the over 60s, well, over 70s, over 60 people with chronic, chronic non-communicable diseases. Uh, those are included in the vulnerable persons. PPEs must be, must be worn by the sample collection personnel. Notice we're using the terminal SCP rather than DCO, sample collection per, uh, personnel, full PPE. Uh, and gloves and masks must be worn by athletes. Uh, <clears throat> and there is no a need for PCR tests if we are entering a bubble. So we did some testing in, in Trinidad um, doing CPL. And we had to do pieces, PCR tests. We had to, 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 to wear PPEs before we could enter that bubble that was down there. Um, we are unfortunately not essential workers. So seven o'clock is just now, we got to get inside. So we don't get emergency passes issued as essential, work, as essential workers. Um, we are also reducing the number of personnel to a minimum in doing any mission. We maintain physical distancing, sanitization is sanitization and sanitization over and over is implemented and encouraged and stressed and we don't get any contact. There's no contact with the sample collection officers as, and the athletes, no shaking of hands and, and all that. So that is what's going on. There's an international standard for testing, as I mentioned, that is maintained. Some anti-doping organizations have created self-sample collection um, equipment where they ship this equipment to you, tell you do the test and send it back to the lab. That has not yet been approved by WADA, but it was one way during the closed down, um, lockdown period in order to get persons to still do some testing. And testing has been done internationally. Something as simple as a pen, that you're using, you use a pen and you keep your pen. If a pen is there, it has to be sanitized after use. All the sample collection vessels, the drinks, the tables, the seats are sanitized. Um, and the other thing I will mention, and, and this was mentioned by Dr. Harvey as well, vaccine production. WADA has been monitoring the vaccine production to make sure that it doesn't happen anything that will cause an adverse analytical finding. Uh, it actually sits at the table of the international grouping on um, production of drugs. So they're in it from early o'clock. Of course, if you're COVID-19 positive, uh, you are excluded from sample collection at this time. I just gonna speak a little because they were asked to speak about whereabouts. There's a new app that WADA has, which facilitates athlete compliance with the whereabouts um, situation where athletes know, of course not know, but for a long time have had some difficulty in saying where they are and when they're likely to be tested. You know, they need to, to, be, to state where they are from six in the morning to 11 at night and give an hour every day. There's no app on the phone that it's better than what the current app, the Adams app that was used is it's actually powered by Adams, but it supports for out of competition testing. What athletes have said, I'm a clean athlete, come and test me anywhere, anytime, even if there is a um, pandemic going on. So this new app called Athlete Central is now available and accessible for athletes. And this is where we're going to be, what we're going to be using a lot in the future. You would have heard about Adams, which is the anti-doping administration and management system. 
And this is a clearinghouse where all, where all data is stored, is used by anti-doping organizations, used by athletes right now with the whereabouts, it's used for therapeutic use, exemption management, it's used for test distribution planning, it's used for results management, where the results are put into this Adams app, and also the laboratory results are, are sent from the laboratory to this, to this management system, computerized system confidential so that everything is put in place and we are trying to maintain the integrity of, of, of doping control. So with those few words, um, oh yeah, I just want to tell you about the anti-doping e-learning, um, which is anti-doping education and learning platform, which is a new uh, program where it provides education and learning for everyone. Okay, it gives opportunity to those who need to know about clean sport and anti-doping. Uh, you can find several resources, several courses. As a matter of fact, for Tokyo 2020, which is scheduled to be held in 2021, all team physicians must undergo training using the ADEL. Athletes, coaches, parents, the medical professional, all athlete support personnel can get information to anti-doping education and learning platform. It is on the WADA website and you can get all the information that you need. And these are some of the resources you see here, the WADA website, www.wada-ama.org. We also have the Caribbean RADA website, the NADCC website, Canadian, USA, and UK website. So those are some of the resources that one can use to get anti-doping information, including information, current information about anti-doping during COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Aline, for having me and willing to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Dr. Large. Yes, of course, there are questions. Uh, and the first one, I, and this one is from me. Um, I realized that you said that uh, anyone who's COVID-19 positive, they've been excluded uh, from sample collection. Is there any special reason for that? Well, we don't want to put the sample collection personnel under any undue risk. We, there are, however, as we mentioned earlier, there are some persons who may be COVID-19 positive but might not know because they're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. um, so a risk assessment is done. And the first question that you ask, we may ask is that question. Now, in order to evade testing, someone could go and say yes. If you say that, that is a fraudulent um, situation you put yourself in. And if it can be proven that you try to defraud the anti-doping um, organization, you are liable to four years ban. So that is the reason why it is put in place. Uh, although um, we have been able to um, persons, test persons in quarantine if allowed. Okay, great, great. Can an athlete refuse drug testing if self-isolated or if they're in quarantine? Or if he doesn't feel any, uh, feeling some symptoms um, from taking uh, any collection of a sample? Um, an athlete should not refuse um, to be tested if in Quarantine. In, in the situation of Barbados, of course, our doping control officers or sample collection personnel would not be able to access the Harrison's Point or Blackman and Gallup or the isolation hotels. But someone in quarantine can still be tested um, because the quarantine situation is where you have been either exposed to the virus or you may be awaiting a result. So a risk assessment is taken there, there and then, and a decision is made based on the risk assessment. So there's a questionnaire that we have that the athlete would, would commit, would, would, um, would state, would co complete, sorry, and then a decision will be made whether it is too much of a risk to do that. Then at that time, if you do refuse bluntly, you are to be sanctioned under the results management process where a hearing can be called and if it is shown that you 
refuse to submit to doping control when asked to do so, that is an anti-doping rule violation and subjected to a uh, sanction of up to four years. Okay. Um, should athletes take the COVID-19 vaccine or are there any concerns associated with this in terms of a positive doping test or results, I should say? Right. So I, I alluded to that in my presentation. The World Anti-Doping Agency has been on the International Pharmaceutical Council and working hand in hand with pharmaceutical country, companies, not only for um, COVID-19, but for any development of any drugs so that we'll be in there when new drugs are coming out and, and no, I said we there um, <laughs> before it gets on the market, so to speak. Uh, so this is a normal thing. COVID-19 vaccines are now being developed. There are, I think, 64 companies or, um, yes, companies marketing or in various stages of development of vaccines at this stage. And it's impossible for WADA to monitor each one. But as the development goes on, they will check and see what is in them and make sure that there's nothing in it that will cause any adverse analytical finding. Okay, a question from one of our viewers. Anti-doping control has always been behind those who use PEDs. Now with COVID-19, how big has this gap grown? Do you have any idea? Anti-doping control was also used? PEDs. PEDs, performance informant drugs. Yes, yes. Um, actually, it is interesting that despite, okay, during, during the height of the pandemic, some of the laboratories had closed. The courier companies were not, some, some, some countries were closed down or locked off and borders were closed. So it, it was difficult for some organizations, anti-doping organizations to, to do the doping controls and then to get them to the, the, the laboratories. As you know, there are only about 35 laboratories that are accredited that can do urine testing throughout the whole world. We presently use North America, but there's also one in Cuba, there's Colombia, there's Brazil in this hemisphere. Um, so, a USA, of course. So, that has been, was a challenge initially. However, with the opening, gradual reopening, that has not been a problem. And latest statistics state that there have been an increasing number of doping controls being done. So, it has not been too much of a problem in recent times. Okay, another question from one of our viewers. Uh, can the presence of the vaccine in your system show a change in the athlete's blood profile? Is there any evidence? And maybe Dr. Lord, you can go first and then Dr. Harvey, you can join in on that question too as well. Dr. Lord. Yes, um, I, I must say at, at present knowledge, there's no, no, no evidence that there is any change in the blood profile from the, the vaccine, as Dr. Harvey says, you inject this virus, adenovirus, into the system and then your body reacts to it. So it shouldn't really affect your blood system negatively. But I'll leave over, over to um, Ariane. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, the, the novel aspect of this technology is, is, is pretty clean in that sense. So really the reaction that your body will be having will be an immune response. And so no, you shouldn't have anything affecting your, your blood profile more than that of an acute immune response. So you might have fever, if you measure inflammatory markers, for example, those will temporarily go up, temporarily go up and come back down. But with respect to anything that would violate um, anti-doping regulations not not that has been seen or shown thus far and expected to show thus far. Okay, another question, I guess this is for you, Dr. Harvey, again, from uh, Jonathan Ali. Does the vaccine change your DNA? I would like to be taller. <laughs> 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 no, the vaccine does not change your DNA. It utilizes a piece of viral DNA that makes proteins only. So it's almost as if it gives you um, kind of like a, a template 
to be able to copy and make just a small protein of the COVID-19 virus. It does not actually change your DNA in any way, shape or form. And a lot of people, that's a good question because it is, you know, when you look and ask about how va this vaccine and the new novel ones are developed, that is a concern um, in terms of on the face of it, but no, it does not change your DNA. You remain who you are. Hi, um, good evening to the esteemed panel, um, Dr. Lord. I have a question for Dr. Lord, is he still there? Yes. Hi, good evening, Dr. Lord. Okay, you have a good you have a good first name. Same name, first name is me. So that means that you are a very good man. <laughs> um, Dr. Lord, I noticed that you mentioned um, earlier about speaking uh, towards the fact of um, how critical it is uh, for the physical distancing and the wearing to some extent of the PPE. Um, but I have noticed um, even with foot, in the era of football that they don't seem to follow that protocol because I've seen them hugging, shaking hands in some sports, some um, football competitions. You probably have seen it here and late that they've allowed to start back. Although they don't have the crowds in the, in the arenas or what have you, they're still clutching. And so it, my question to you is this, because I'm a bit confused in that area. If you are saying, and they, they are saying that the, the protocols must be followed and must be, and there would be stiffer penalties, especially for athletes that do this. And if the coaches are allowing them to do that, then how is it that uh, from what I have seen and others have seen as well, um, they, they are getting away of this. What, what can you say to that? And I have another question for the, uh, the, the other doctor, but I wanna hear from you first. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, you know, what we see on television is always, um, could be misleading. You have to recall that those people are in a bubble. Uh, in NBA, in, even in the series that we saw in the, the One Day Internationals in Antigua recently, the 2020s that's going on, you see people touching and hugging. As a matter of fact, when I was looking at the Barbados matches in the, in the uh, colonial life, um, the One Day Internationals, the only person I saw with a mask was, was our physiotherapist, um, Jackie King. And I, I did mention her and say, well, message her and say, she, she's obviously doubly cautious. So those are in the bubble. Those are people who have remained together. They've been tested and proven not to have had um, COVID-19. And they've been retested several times during that process. Tested before they go to, to wherever they are tested when they get there and tested several times during there so that anybody and anybody who breaches that, that those protocols will be excluded from from there so if we go and start playing our football or our basketball and continue and do the things that we're seeing on tv we will be exposing ourselves to COVID-19 because it's out there in the community as Dr. Bess says they're symptomatic and you talk about the possible complications that could occur but the hugging and the, and the clutching, as you call it, um, could be dangerous, especially, as he said, in athletes where a lot of virus could be going around when you're breathing heavily and, and so on. Very well. Um, okay. Okay, Adrian, you I, can go with your second question, but I want to remind uh, those who are joining us. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Can anyone ahead, hear me? Oh, okay, good. No, I wasn't sure. Sorry, sorry, do forgive me. Yes, um, this question is for Dr. Cattle, Ms. Cattle, and the, the other um, lady doctor as well. Sorry, can't remember her name now. Um, now, with 
the cha the many challenges that I find that uh, we hear. Harvey. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, um, Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Um, with the ongoing challenges that I find that the physically challenged um, people that have um, the, the robotic legs to run with in the wheelchairs and what have you, they have very serious challenges that I don't think, in my opinion, have been really fully addressed, especially in the area of the COVID-19. And I'm talking about from a psychological aspect. I, I would like you to somehow go into a little more detail as in if you have had subjects come to you um, with facing those challenges because you know those those special individuals would need more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, would need more of attention. Uh, psychologically, it plays a more heavier impact on their minds because they're already, um, they're already dealing with the, with the fact that one may not have legs or one may not have some other physical part of their body like a normal person would. And Okay, Dr. Cabin, you can go ahead and respond. Okay, so I, I understand the question. Thank you very much, um, Adrian. I understand the question should be if um, I'm actually interacting at the moment with um, athletes with disabilities. Um, I am not at the moment, but um, of course, should, um, should anyone reach out, I'll be willing to engage in the telehealth aspect of it because um, um, we we are able to, to communicate in many ways that is not, that would not include face-to-face -face, and we'll be able to address, to address a lot of the issues. Um, and in most cases, the, these athletes with disabilities have pretty strong support structures around them. Um, and um, in our cases, they are much stronger than you, you, you will imagine. I have had interactions with them um, in, incredible um, par, par athletes who have been able to surmount many, many challenges. And that is what allows them to be able to be athletes in the first place, that belief that they can conquer all, that, that resilience, that psychological hardiness. And um, should this particular situation be, be difficult for them, of course, we will use whatever research we need to use to see what has worked in other places and with other people and offer the best service we can to them. Not sure if that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Young. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from Misha Craigwell. Uh, what is the recommended minimum period um, for an athlete to take the vaccine before competition? I I'm going to give this to Dr. Harvey. Thank you. Um, well, just referencing back to before competition, it depends on the duration of, you know, are you entering a competitive part of your, of your training year or you mean prior to a competition? So there are two things that impact. One, the actual side effects that you may experience. And those can go up to, you know, three to five days if they're particularly lingering. So ideally, from a side effect standpoint, at least a week before you enter into competition. But the other thing is, if competition is increasing your risk of exposure, your immunity from that first dose doesn't start to kick in fully to give you that first level of protection until about three weeks after you've been immunized. So even though you've got the vaccination, let's say I got it yesterday, my immune system and that response I'm going to have is going to take about three weeks to get me up to where I am at first level of good protection. And then that second booster that happens, that second dose for Oxford AstraZeneca Zeneca, that happens 12 weeks later, then tips me up a bit more so I'm extra protected to maximum. So from a side effect standpoint, at least a uh, a week. And then obviously, if you do have side effects, you do, as Dr. Best has said earlier, want to make sure and check if they're, if they're particularly um, difficult to make sure and check with your medical doctor and check and make sure you're cleared 
to be able to enter um, competition. Although again, it should not impact you at that severity level, but better safe than sorry. And then from a protection from exposure standpoint that competition could pose, three weeks minimum is when you have that first good stage of protection. Also, obviously we want to still continue using your PPE and social distancing and hand hygiene where applicable and where possible, because that still is a, an excellent protective layer for the 30% coverage that you don't get. Yes, thank, thank you, excellent. Uh, we have another question from Jonathan Ali, and I think this is for you again, Dr. Harvey. Is it necessary to take the vaccine if you've already recovered from the virus? So the answer, there's a, and there's a lot of discussion about that. Um, we don't know how long you get immunity after you've actually been infected with COVID-19. So you do get immunity, your body fights it, your body has memory, and you do get a, a certain period of time when if you are exposed to COVID again, your immune system is ready. However, we're not sure if that will be two, three months in one individual versus six months in another. So the variability in the unknowing um, makes us want to, and the impact that COVID has generally, we want to make sure that you do or are offered that opportunity for more kind of standardized protection that we, that we know with our vaccines that have been tested and are being trialed. So yes, you should be vaccinated after you've had COVID infection. How far out? Still in debate, we don't like to do it too close because again, we want the vaccine to, to re-stimulate. And if your immune system is already hyped up, it, it won't work as well. Um, but definitely the aim is to try to get a standardized kind of um, longer term immunity from vaccination. So after you've gotten it, yes. How long after? Still in discussion, but I would recommend that, yes. Great, thank you very much. Dr. Bess, don't feel left out. We have some questions for you. Um, in, it's four months away from the Olympics, uh, and as a nation, the, the, the viewer is asking, um, in terms of preparation for the Olympics, um, are, we, are we ready? Are we going to be ready in terms of our athletes uh, coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, boy. Excellent question. And whew, we really... It's going to be a challenge. Now, it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. Um, what have the coaches been doing with the athletes? What have the prep been up to now? I know we have a lot of our potential athletes being abroad, so they might be even more so ready. But one of the challenges I see, and the others could weigh in, is what has been happening with those that have been in sort of the lockdown situation? You know, um, it's going to be tight. It's going to be tight to answer from this angle. So. The question is what a lot have been doing. Um, it is a difficult question, but okay. some have been able, you know, you want to be competition ready and not just <laughs> to say that you're ready. And we're going to need to get in some training and some competition as well. Um, and I could listen to the editor's views here, but four months is a tight time. Yeah. I can even bounce the question to you as a sports scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll save that for last. Are there any potential cardiac injuries with those people who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic um, with COVID-19? Dr. Best. Ex excellent question. I mean, we're learning so much as we go along. This is also an next example of an answer that has been changing for us, right? I'm going to answer that first by saying, no, there's no potential permanent cardiac injury in this group. And I'm saying that because based on most of the guidelines that we're looking at right now, um, they're actually based on the research on saying that we don't have to, the guidelines are saying that we don't have to necessarily do any specialized testing in the asymptomatic mal patient. And that's based on the research saying that there's no major risk of this. I'm going to stress of no permanent or longstanding cardiac injury. No, there may be a risk of having somewhat, and when people do the cardiac um, MRIs, they may be getting a little inflammation of the heart, as I mentioned before. But that's why we want to return to the sport slowly, and then there will be no permanent damage as well, right? Um, one group that I didn't zoom in on when I was talking earlier was particularly the pediatric group. And it just came to me because we know, of course, we have our concerns when we're thinking about the NAPSAP athlete, the BSAP, et cetera. And so what just came to mind when this question was asked is, 
I remembered some guidelines came out in January from the American Academy of Pediatricians. And this is an interesting question because I think going forward, we're gonna to have to also define what is mal symptoms. And that group actually defined it. When they were talking about the, uh, the children, they said that mal symptoms is a child that had COVID, that had fever for less than four days, or uh, even had muscle pains for less than a week. Right? And I think we could define that there nicely. A lot of the other guidelines don't normally define the mal. So I think, well, once we stand in that sort of category, I don't think there's the risk of potential long-term cardiac injury. Um, but this is a debate that's going to be raging going forward. Um, and then the other groups are going to be really special. And I can't tell you what's going to be the amount of cardiac injury when we start getting to the moderate symptoms, as well as in the children, there's the severe one. Um, you hear recently about multiple system inflammatory syndrome, right? And that particular group got, a, got some specialized testing going forward and stuff. And that child should not actually compete for three to six months. So it's a good question, but I say, as it stands, we, we're not thinking right now that there's any permanent potential cardiac injury. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Lord, a uh, viewer wants to know, um, can you get any advantages from taking the vaccine similar to those that you may get from performance enhancement drugs. Is there any evidence there? There's no, there's no evidence there that you get any advantages or, or disadvantage. Um, the only disadvantage you get is the soreness in the arm. And, and immediately after the vaccine, um, a few days after you can have some um, flu-like symptoms, but there's no advantages that you will get except that you will feel more comfortable that you are protected to a certain degree and you may protect others. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine um, does have, uh, after the first shot, and I, I, I just completed three days and three weeks and two days after my first shot. So the, the science says that I'm 60% protected right now, waiting for my second shot, which I hope will be down in late April or, or early May, um, I will get about 90. So the advantage is protection, but not, no performance enhancing benefit. Another question for you, Dr. Lord. We've heard about prevention and after recovery, but is there anything being used that could challenge recovery for athletes? as they may have to be careful with what is being used to aid the recovery uh, and may cause any violations in terms of the water testing? Um, when an athlete, I'm gonna address it in this way. When, when, if, an, if an athlete gets COVID-19, um, he may be given a variety, a cocktail of different drugs, which may include um, corticosteroids, dexamethasone is one, one of them. And dexamethasone is prohibited in competition only and intravenously as it may be given. However, the athlete should request a therapeutic use exemption because this is not a competition situation, but because these things can stay in the blood for a longer period of time, you should still request a therapeutic use exemption because if you go back into competition, I don't expect based on what Dr. Dr. Best said that you'll be back into competition any short period of time anyhow. So there is that athlete really having had symptomatic COVID-19 would not be, should not get back into competition in any, any short period of time. And therefore there are no performance benefits that they will get from the treatment that they will have had um, during, during hospitalization, but anytime any athlete receives treatment from any person, one of the duties of the athlete is to say, I am an athlete in the residential testing pool. I can be tested at any time. Let me know what drugs you are using. And you find out if any of those drugs are on the prohibited list so that you could submit to the, to the um, therapy use exemption committee um, the details and requests a uh, retroactive exemption for use of that drug. An athlete or doctor can use any drug to treat an athlete, whether or not it is on the list. 
in an emergency situation. No, as I said, in an emergency situation. And then the athlete then has the, the onus is on the athlete to then apply for exemption. And then it's up to the committee to determine if it was justified or not. Uh, it was not a case of doping. So I, I, I hope that answers the, the question. Okay, thank you very much. Remember, viewers on Zoom, you can raise your hand and you can ask your question. Uh, but in the meantime, I have a question for you, Dr. Cattle. I know you've touched on the psychological challenges, but is there any plan in place to facilitate the athletes training locally for non-contact sport? It's already marked, but I'm not aware if any efforts have been made to facilitate athletes that may be struggling psychologically as the window to train for competition is closing. And I assume this person is speaking about the Olympics uh, and maybe you can even add in there um, the possibility of Carifta too as well. Yes, thank you. The, we, we in, all, in all instances, we adhere to the government directives in relation to participation in sport and all other similar activities. At the moment, the directives speak to no sport. They even mention the lone golfer out on the course by him or herself, and they said no golf. So at the moment, there is, <laughs> there, there's a barrier to actual training in, in the way that we would like to do this in groups and competition. However, the AAB, like um, other associations, are planning for return to training. There are protocols that have been written up and um, in some cases submitted in order to receive um, requesting permission to return to training and to return to competition. Um, on almost a weekly basis, the technical committee goes back and revamps the competition schedule in the hope that at some moment, sometime soon, we'll be able to resume competition. And we've made those changes to the program. Um, we know that there's a change to, to CRIFTA. So we've changed the program, the, the qualifying opportunities, so that as soon as we get permission to open back and as soon as we get permission to return to competition, that program will be put in place. Opportunities for, for quali qualification will be offered and uh, we'll make the appropriate moves towards team selection for the, the meets, so CRIFTA and Olympic Games. But at the moment, as we said, we will follow the directives um, and there's no equivocation on that. But we are behind the scenes, making the preparations, being cognitively flexible and changing as the time moves along so that we will be ready at the first opportunity. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cattle. Uh, from Kathleen Stewart, um, will an athlete with allergies to 98% of medication be allowed to take the COVID-19 vaccine? 98% of medication. Dr. Harkin? So allergies came up as, or, or are present as, a, as one of the things you consider in, in hesitating before vaccinating somebody because of the concern of a severe allergic reaction, also known as anaphylaxis. It really depends on the allergy that you get though. Um, so that is, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, that is the kind of individual approach that you and your physician would have about whether or not you're somebody who should consider not taking the vaccine. If it's a very mild allergy or they are very mild allergies, you get a little bit of a rash or you get a little bit of tummy discomfort, the likelihood of an allergic reaction to vaccination manifesting a severe allergic reaction anaphylaxis is extremely low. Additionally, the Oxford AstraZeneca itself has um, a much lower field risk of causing allergic reaction as compared to the Moderna and Pfizer, those reports that came out in places that were utilizing those. So overall, as I said, the risk for allergic reaction, severe allergic reaction is extremely low. If you are someone who has a lot of allergies and your pattern of allergies to other substances has been in, in the vein of severe allergic reaction is definitely something you should discuss with your um, doctor to determine the risk of you getting the vaccine versus the benefit that you would get from being vaccinated. So that's that's a question you, I would take to your regular doctor and then and then you two make that decision going forward. 
Okay, thank you very much. There are two last questions and then we're gonna wrap up. So I'll give you at the end of these two questions, I'll give you about a minute so that you can uh, wrap up your presentation and any key points that you want to leave with our viewers. Uh, Dr. Harvey, this question should be pretty straightforward. Dr. Harvey, you said that all athletes should take the vaccine, but isn't it for our uh, athletes from 18 years and over? Yes, so I will clarify that statement. Yes, the, the vaccines that are currently on the market and being used have been tested on populations of 18 years of age and over. So we don't know how vaccines will function and how they will affect under 18. Not to say that we expect that, but we, we just haven't tested and pushed, got, have them gone through to, to marketing for the ones that we currently have. Obviously no, because there are smaller subsets and populations of people who want to know what vaccines will be helpful to them, pregnant populations, children, et cetera. They're now doing subtesting on those um, groups of people. So to clarify, all adult athletes um, right now, and as we get more and more into all the vaccines that are currently in development and currently being trialed, the pediatric associations will come out and, and be able to guide us as to whether or not um, pediatric athletes are able to be vaccinated and go forward from there. Thank you very much, Dr. Harvey. Our final question, I'll give this one to Dr. Bess. Are athletes with exercise-induced asthma equally vulnerable to COVID-19 uh, virus when compared with asthma patients or other groups of respiratory patients? You know, they have grouped them, them all together as respiratory, um, respiratory ailments or so. And I would say they are equally at risk as well. Uh, I don't know, Ariane, do you agree with me? <laughs> I, I would agree. And only because just the way COVID just goes for the lungs first. I mean, it yeah. may also go for other organs, but it goes for the lung first. Yeah. If you have any underlying respiratory disorder, whether it be triggered by um, exercise or another form of asthma or respiratory condition, I think that makes you higher risk than, than a non-respiratory person. So yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Allen, just for that there. See that liking for the lungs, that affinity for the lungs, because they got some special cells in the lungs that got some receptors that just bind, and that's the lock that the coronavirus started to just unlock and getting those cells multiply and then start destroying cells in the lung. Bam. Um, yeah, we got to say you're at risk. I, I, I feel I should throw in this question here. Uh, I saw an article, and this is for me, an article recently or something online with some Jamaican uh, scientists who have said that they have found um, that our, our local medication that we use has some positive um, effects on preventing uh, contraction of COVID-19 uh, virus. Any comments on that, Mr. Besser, Dr. Bess, you're shaking your head, so you seem to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've seen it. I don't know the details. I really shouldn't step into commenting on what I don't know about. Uh, so I'll be the first to bail out and leave. Um, what, what, was the what was it again, uh, Dr. Besser? Menthol. Menthol crystals. Menthol crystals. <laughs> Menthol crystals, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to see the data. Is there any is there any evidence so, um, from you any of the panelists? That, that, that has to be a peer reviewed study, and we need to get the details. Uh, but I don't know what Dr. Harvey has knows. He, she might know these people more personally than me. <laughs> yeah. He said that because I'm a monograd. No, I, I if there's evidence supporting it, I'm all for it. Um, as a evidence, we're we're in 2021. Evidence base is more accessible now than it has ever been. So. If they find some evidence for it and we can implement it into protocol and support it, I'm all for it. Because I was about to go buy my, all my mental crystals. <laughs> we shall see. Start my, my own, <laughs> my own uh, process of vaccinating locally. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I want to give each of you a minute to wrap up. So we'll start with Dr. Benz, a minute to wrap up quickly. All right, my, my minute of fame here, folks. Dr. Benz. My carry home points will be. Um, remember that COVID-19 could have some lasting effects and definitely um, these effects can actually affect your performance in your sport or so. Uh, it's not meaning that it have to be permanent, but it could actually delay your return to sport. 
So my focus want to be on, let us try to prevent you from catching the COVID-19, catching the coronavirus. But if you do catch it, let's work together with a gradual return to play to minimize the long-term effects that you actually described. Um, a gradual return, so we decrease the risk of sudden death, et cetera. And oops, let's work together to just get you back to performing. Yep. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bass, Dr. Harvey. I always admire athletes. Um, I am not an athlete. I've always wanted to be one. And I think it's really important to recognize that you put in the work and you don't want to threaten that. So just to echo Dr. Best, prevention is better than cure. And if you can prevent all of the possibilities of impacting your own health, your performance, your ability to compete by getting vaccinated, do it. It's and I think generally from a global standpoint, vaccination is also the way we get back into sport and play on an international level. So if we all get vaccinated, the world can open up again and we can all start back competing. So that's my takeaway. Thank you very much, Dr. Harvey. Dr. Kata. Thank you. The, my last words, we have time. Time is on our side. Athletes, coaches, parents, you have time to work on the strengths, to work out the deficiencies, to, to improve, to have a visualization of what would be the improved version of the athlete under your care. Use the time wisely. Work on skills, work on mental skills, work on psychological skills, work on energy distribution. We talked about spiritual and physical, emotional energy and how that is used. Take the opportunity right now to decide to step back a little bit from the hustle and bustle of daily life and work on yourself so that you exit COVID and COVID's um, stressful periods in the best way, being better persons, stronger, faster and being able to climb higher than ever and be able to perform at maximum. And of course, thank you very much. Dr. Cattle, thank you very much. That's, that's longer than a minute, but never mind. Dr. Lord. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had five to seven minutes earlier and I'm going to stick to 60 seconds. So it's important that we stay up to date and keep up to date with anti-doping protocols. Um, and similarly, with what we said this evening, might not be relevant next week, next month. Things are changing, things are fluid, so you need to keep up to date with what's going on. As far as doping controls, we will continue to do doping controls to protect the rights of the clean athlete and to produce clean sport. Uh, we're not gonna take any risk for the athlete or the sample collection uh, personnel as we continue um, to level the playing field. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we would like to thank all of the following partners and sponsors for making this second webinar a reality and a really interesting topic. Uh, Cube Vision, uh, Design Lab, the National Sports Council, the Barbados Olympic Association, the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners, the members of the AAB Medical Panel, the Public Relations Committee, and all the members of the AAB. And of course, we could not have done it without our panelists, Dr. Rene Bess, uh, Dr. Ariane Harvey, Dr. June Cattle, and Dr. Adrian Lord. We thank you very much for providing that stimulating uh, discussion and, and presentations um, on this very important topic uh, during this period of COVID-19. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You're welcome. Remember to stay tuned with the AAB uh, through our social media platform. You have the Facebook. I have Instagram at AA Barbados and the YouTube link, the Athletic Association of Barbados. Thank you for being a part of tonight's webinar. Our next webinar will be on the 20th of March and we look forward to having you here. That webinar is mainly for the constituents of the AAB, so the athletes, the parents, the coaches, and we'll be discussing the way forward return to competition. And in that webinar, we're gonna have the president of the Bermuda Athletic Association um, and she'll be talking a little bit about Carifta 2021. Thank you for being a part of this webinar. Have a fantastic night. Stay safe. Remember the protocols. Have a fantastic evening. Goodbye. Bye.